I'm Matt Pinfield coming to you from Spotlight Live on Broadway in New York City. Today's guest is one of the most influential and important punk legends of all time. From his beginnings with the one and only Clash, through Big Audio Dynamite, and now with Carbon Silicon. Thanks very much. It's Hi, so man. great to have you here. All you right. know, been a fan for a long time. I was just want to say, saw the Clash at the Capitol Theater when you guys debuted London Calling that night, and uh, I remember saying that song. Uh, Joe didn't introduce it as London Calling. He said, "This song has a line in it that says phony Beatlemania has bitten the dust." Oh, that's, and that's then I saw just... you know you on Broadway as well, which is where we're shooting right now. All right. Here at Bonds, just along the road, <laughs> back down the street, <laughs> right? So. It's great to actually have the opportunity to interview you here. Thanks very much. Been a fan since the beginning. Mick, tell, uh, you know, tell us about what it was like as a child for you and how you discovered rock and roll and became a big fan of music and what made you want to pick up the guitar. What were some of the first things you remember seeing, maybe the live shows that you saw and, uh, and what you were listening to as a kid? I know Mott the Hoople was a big one for you. Yeah, I used to follow them around the country quite a bit yeah. with a bunch of friends. And um, I saw, sort of started going to shows really quite young, you know. And uh, we had a lot of free concerts. Sort of grew up in the in the late '60s and in London, and it was a very exciting yeah. place to be at that time, you know. Yeah. What was some, what was your first live show? Do you remember who you first? Yeah, I can't remember. It was a big free concert in Hyde Park, and uh, there was this band called Nice, yeah. right, which went Keith Emerson from the, ELP. <laughs> exactly. He went on to be in the ELP, and they were. Topping the bill, and there was another group called what, which you won't have heard of, called Blossom Toes. Yeah, I've actually heard uh, of them. They're I mean, a lot of these psychedelic now, compilations. They have like kind of record collector things. But yeah, but back then they were a really lot of people probably won't have heard of them. Yeah, most people wouldn't. Yeah. Now, when you got together with Joe the first time, and Bernie Rhodes, your manager, ended up bringing Joe from the One Hundred Ones down to meet you guys first. Yeah. Time. What was that meeting like? What was the, what was the vibe? Oh, I can't, you know, it was like we, we were in this little squat in West London in Shepherd's Bush, and we were all waiting for him to come. We were a bit nervous because he already was the Joe Strummer that we knew from watching on stage. And so, but it, we very soon, he came and we were all like, we had something that he didn't have as well, so that was kind of good, you know what I mean? We already sort of knew, we had our look together a bit and stuff like that, sort of certain elements we brought to him. And we had a few tunes as well, and so kind of just started working straight away. Yeah, which is pretty amazing. And then we said, look, put this jacket, try this jacket on and... <laughs> yeah, and changed his <laughs> so look from kind of like a that... A little bit, that, yeah. uh, that unwashed hippie look it to really like the punk cool, look. <laughs> but it wasn't, it wasn't like a total long-haired hippie. I was more, I was like long-haired before I sort of met the Sex Pistols and then I went off and got a haircut. Yeah. But let's talk about the making of London Calling and working with Guy Stevens, the producer you worked with on that. And, uh, yeah. you know, I know he worked with Martha Hoople. Why did you end up choosing That's right. Guy? Well, his guy was, look, Guy Stevens was really... Um, like a catalyst kind of producer, he kind of inspired you very by direct contact, yeah. and so that was like kind of like that made you play better right in there. It was like right in there with, in the studio with you. You know, what yeah, I mean? he would he throw chairs and go wild and scream, kind of swing them about a little bit and stuff like that. But to get you excited and worked it was up. It's quite funny because there was big piles of orchestra. Because it was quite a big studio and there's all the orchestra chairs. You know, they pile them up so yeah. when when the orchestra comes in, they take all the chairs down. Yeah. And he was like taking, trying to take the top chair off, and the whole thing came down on him. <laughs> and so on. that was like, <laughs> but it wasn't nothing unusual really. Yeah. And so it was quite. It was like kind of energetic sessions where you had to live. On be on your nerves, at, as as most of it is anyway. Yeah, it's amazing. So tell me about the title of the Carbon Silicon album, The Last Post, because you can take that a couple yeah. different ways. Tell me. Well, for me, it's like a, it's, <laughs> it's a definitely a multi-meaning title, and lots of people. Usually, I like to leave it open to your own interpretation, whoever you are. But for me, it's like you know when you've got a bill and you've been you've been really mean to pay it, yeah. And then you eventually get around to doing it, and it's like a red letter, and then you get down to the post box and you've just missed the last post. Yeah, <laughs> that's it for me. Yeah. But t if you ask Tony, he'd probably tell you, oh, it's the last blog of culture. Yeah. Or something like that. But so there's a couple. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, I like to leave it up to people to think what they think. Yeah, and, and always. Well, listen, Mick, I want to thank you for coming by. We're out of time. My it was, pleasure. It was great to have All you. All right, nice to see you. Really nice to see you again, right. Mick. It was a pleasure. Cool, Great thanks. to interview you again, and really happy to have you.